Welcome to the Gentleman Psychic. Make certain to hit the like and subscribe button and ring that notification bell to be updated on videos like this and many others. Also check me out on Patreon under the Gentleman's House link in the bio. Stick around for a very special walking tour of the life and times of Vampira. Myla Normi was born in 1922 to parents of Finnish descent. There is some debate about her birth, either in Gloucester, Massachusetts, or by her claim in Petsamo, Finland. At an early age, Myla moved with her family to Ashtabula, Ohio, and then after to Astoria, Oregon, which had a large Finnish community. Her parents worked in the literary arts, and straight out of high school in 1940, she pursued acting in Los Angeles and New York. Specifically, she was working in monologues. She became a top model for Alberto Vargas, Bernard of Hollywood, and Man Ray, while also exciting film producers. She started taking on small roles like in Victor Seville's 1947 film, If Winter Comes. Unfortunately, in 1944, actress Mae West feared Myla was upstaging her during the play Catherine Was Great and got her fired. It seemed Myla was just too interesting for the girl next door and showboat glitz as the high profile actors were afraid of her side railing their careers. She found herself left out, but all the while signifying her into a stigma of being some dark-natured seductress. Of course, the era was the post-war with the nuclear families, mom as housewives, trim lawns, and white picket fence. But befitting to her typecasting, she starred in a Broadway horror-themed midnight show called Spook Scandals. The audience thrilled by her screams, fainting and pale lurking in a coffin and fake cemetery. She was a favorite among men who evaded their boring lives to see her high kicking at places like Florentine Gardens. So there's this uh, new part that was coming up uh, in one of the films and I was thinking, oh, hello. Well, here we are here at uh, what was Googie's, a place where the up and coming actors would uh, try to chat and see what was happening, you know, in, for their roles. Uh, and Myla had been to a Hollywood premiere with Jack Simmons, and they both wanted- Not to be confused with Richard. No, no, not Richard. And they both wanted to be in films, of course. She spotted Jimmy, uh, James Dean, at the premiere and wanted to meet him. Well, Jack had already known Jimmy, so, she arran so he arranged for Myla to meet Jimmy at a famous coffee spot called Googies, which were, were standing on on the place where well, it used to be. Yeah, but you can still be. get coffee here, though it'll cost you 10 bucks for a latte. <laughs> I think you know what we mean. It rhymes with... <laughs> <laughs> now, it was at Laurel Canyon and Sunset Boulevard, and it was next to Schwab's Drugstore. Myla describes his arrival of James Dean we were sitting at a booth next to a window and he roared up on his motorcycle and he shook the glass. He parked in a no parking spot, but that was kind of his thing. And he walked in with a girl and I jumped up from the booth, but knocked my crazy bone. I think she's talking about her funny bone, yelling, Jesus Christ. Everyone thought I had a stroke and asked what was the matter. A little later, Myla was formally introduced, curiously asking about Jimmy's deceased mother. She says, where is she? And he said, the girl I'm with, well, she's over there at the counter. She said, no, your mother. And he goes, shh, is it that obvious? Myla said, yes, it's pretty obvious. What she was talking about is channeling and Myla had a gift of it. She said she saw a little boy looking for his mother, desperate to find her. Jimmy replied, well, she cut me out, which unfortunately meant she had committed suicide when he was young. Myla's mother, too, was an alcoholic, and she died from that. Their meeting started a bittersweet friendship with a shared interest in the occult, and both had their neuroses, as she claimed. 
I think that's the end of that one. Yep. In 1953, at Lester Horton's annual Ball Carib Masquerade, a benefit for the Lester Horton Dance Theater, Myla and her husband Dean Reisner, a writer for The Outer Limits, attended wearing a costume inspired by Charles Adams' character, character Morticia. She wasn't called Morticia at that time, though. Myla described her choice of attire as trying to find what was appealing at the time. In the newspaper, she read the most popular show was called The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, a family show about an average family. Well, she thought, I could never do that. I'm appalled by such people, and even in fun, I can't do that. Her idea took form to satirize them, but then she remembered the Adams family and the character who was unnamed at the time, Morticia. She said, I made the costume by hand, wore pale green or possibly blue powder, long toenails as if in the tomb, and bound my chest. Toenails? Oh yes. I, she Quite wore something, long right? Toenails? She she I had did long toenails, and she um, was barefoot, from what I understand. Her persona was an instant hit, and she won first prize. Uh, and she said that it was a t she took the radio. Uh, that was the first prize for her. Um, one of those in attendance was Hunt Stromberg Jr., a television producer looking to cast a horror host for Los Angeles KABC TV. By the time he saw her, he had tried to fight his way through the curious onlookers, but was left holding his glass slipper, so to speak. Yet that would not be the best of stories, and Stromberg pursued and searched for various modeling agencies before getting in touch with Rudy Gernreich, who ha uh, knew of her number. Uh, of course I know her, he said. She was the first woman in California to wear backless shoes. Uh, she was listed as a housewife. They found her in the phone book as Mrs. Dean Reisner. And here we are at the 7566, now it's something completely different, but it was his famous dance troupe uh, studio. And uh, so, yeah, I guess we're on to our next place. <laughs> Little dancing for you. <laughs> Little medley. KABC TV, original location now called Prospect Studios. The Vampire Show aired from 1954 to 1955, located here. According to Myla, the Vampire name came from her husband. Outside of her reimaging of a sexier Morticia character, partly inspired by bizarre magazine models, she also turned to early influences like the Dragon Lady, a character from the comic strip in Terry and the Pirates. From the 1950s film Sunset Boulevard, Norma Desmond. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. Tamil. Uh, is it Theta 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 Barra, Theta Barra. the original goth queen. Mm. Now there you go. And the evil queen from Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. You know about that one? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Plus, she added, I went for glam creepy, long cigarette holder, long fingernails, big padded bosoms, heavily arched eyebrows, fishnet stockings, low cut black gown, and cinched waist. What do you think? What do you <laughs> Her show would air on April 30th, 1954, with a preview on KABC TV called Dig Me Later, Vampira at 11 o'clock, near midnight. The official premiere was then followed next night, entitled The Vampire Show, and it found success in the first weeks and eventually worked its way down to 10.30. She was making almost $60 a week, and she did say that she had to spend that on taxis and makeup and such. 
Every show would begin with her gliding down a fog-covered corridor and end with her signature scream. Would you like to try that? I don't think I can match her scream. <laughs> okay. What about you? All right, we'll cover <laughs> your throat. You can scream. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, very good. Once she got everyone's attention, as, as she did, she, she would introduce and after that, poke fun at the film reclining seductively on a macabre Victorian couch. She loved dark puns and asked viewers to write her for epitaphs instead of autographs. A pet spider, Rollo, was uh, also present. She was considered the original horror host. Now, at the height of her career, she ran for Nightmare of Hollywood, stating dead issues were on the ballot. Another publicized event had her cruising around for KABC's Vampire in a chauffeur-driven 1932 Packard with the roof down and holding a black parasol. She was featured in Life magazine and had a nomination for a Los Angeles Emmy Award as Most Outstanding Female Personality. Things only looked up for Myla. And you were going to say something about that, right? One of my favorite things is seeing how a character develops. Part of the reason Vampyra spoke in those slow, seductive tones was because she was taking her time reading the teleprompter. Very good. Fortunately, we don't have a teleprompter. <laughs> we have Lauren. Yes, we have this piece of paper. Lauren is here. By 1955, a strange turn of events happened to Myla. KABC canceled her series, not from ratings, but from copycats and increased pressure for family-focused entertainment. Her show was picked up on a competing station for a short time, but she ended with only the rights to her character's name. Soon after, she divorced her husband and lived in a tiny apartment at 5906. Carlton Way in Hollywood, California. Of course, someone lives here now, so do not uh, disturb them. Don't disturb. I mean, that's pretty disturbing. Don't disturb. <laughs> she was cash strapped and had just secretly finished modeling for Melissa Fint, uh, the character in the Disney feature of Sleeping Beauty. In the same year, she was attacked by an intruder in her apartment, and on another occasion, she was attacked at a hair salon by an enraged woman who burned her hair off. On September 30th, James Dean died, and ill-conceived rumors spread that Mila wished it upon him, alleging she had a black magic altar set up to curse him in a voodoo doll in his likeness, to which the tabloids happily ran with painting her as bad luck. In reality, she knew she was living uh, I'm sorry, in reality, she knew he was living a fast life and cared little of the consequences. Uh, being blamed for his death put her in a precarious position to brush off the absurdity, a difficult feat in what was a religious conservative 1950s. She was blacklisted. Myla had the heart, though, of a warrior and came back punching, showing her bruises in a publicity photo with her a uh, police officer as if to say, I am not this man's victim. With her head shaved, she posed for the camera. She later created a new look for women never seen before, punk before it was even named so, and attended a Halloween party as a witch with her friend Jack, dressed, who dressed as a bandaged Dean. Notably, Jack was obsessed in love with Dean, but Dean always thwarted his advances. Now back at the apartment, in 1956, Myla was living on just $13 a week with unemployment. With a never give up attitude, Myla readied herself and hopped aboard a Los Angeles City bus to ride over to Quality Studios for her first day of filming a B-movie called Plan 9 from Outer Space. Ooh, Plan 9. Edward D. Wood Jr. directed the film, and it supposedly featured uh, Bella Lugosi, a friend whom she had met a few years back on a Halloween sketch of the Red Skeleton show. Wood passed off the movie as Lugosi's last film, attracting talent that knew the star. Let's quickly go there now. Yes, let's go. Quality Studios, that's what they called it. 
Uh, it's now obviously something else. It's a recording studio and a uh, bar and um, hotel. But uh, it's something all right. <laughs> <laughs> right in Hollywood. It must not have been very reassuring for Myla and the other cast members that did not know Bella Lugosi would not be truly present. He had already passed and Ed Wood used stock footage from a previously unreleased film as well as a stand-in to play the part. Annoyed by the dialogue, Myla refused to say her lines instead of playing Vampira in fear of losing the rights and thereby denying payment. She played a zombie that happened to look a lot like her. The filming would only take about two days to complete, and they would call it a day. Interestingly, uh, the bar now at Gold Diggers was a favorite drinking hole of Edwood back in the day. Part of the building housed the set of Plan 9, and the current or owner claims to have found a trap door used in the movie. Here we are at Vampire's Attic. It's uh, 8642 Melrose Avenue. I mean, it used to be Vampire's Attic. That's right. But you know, this was a very hard place to find, I have to say, and we did find it. And in the 1960s, after a string of film appearances, including the Beat Generation, where she was reciting poetry and holding a rat, and uh, you know, Jackie Coogan was also in that was film. Was he now? Yeah. Another Adams Family reference. Now, she also did various side work, and Myla opened Vampire's Attic. It was an antique store with uh, handmade jewelry and clothing that she um, uh, created, uh, and this was considered her home as well. She catered to people like Grace Slick and the Zappa family. She considered herself a beatnik, but she never said she was a hippie. Before 1964, and according to Myla, she was asked to give up her rights to Vampyra, as they could infringe on the character for the new Adams Family TV show, which of course portrayed, uh, was portrayed by Carolyn Jones. The show's creator wanted full control, but so did Myla, and so Hollywood's uh, ostracism of Myla began enough, another difficult time for her. She was very genuine and took her battles to the end with an up yours attitude. We better have our hard hats on here because that is what remains of a place called the Anti Club at 4658 Melrose Avenue. In the early 80s, Milo was invited to partake in the punk movement which uh, was influential in her own right, she appeared at the anti-club for several macabre readings. She enjoyed this until a rowdy, then a relatively unknown group of kids called the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I had some of those for lunch. <laughs> disturbed her with their antics, such as loud noises. And she left to never do that again. Now, uh, around the same time, Myla was asked by KHJ-TV to bring back Vampyra for television and work closely with the producers. She even was going to get an executive producer credit. Still, unknowing to her, they selected a comedic actress, Cassandra Peterson, without her knowledge and sat both down in a room to meet. Myla disagreed with the show's outcome and still miffed that they did not hire the African-American actress, Lola Falana, to play Vampyra, left for creative differences. The show was halted and it changed its name to Elvira's Movie Macabre with Peterson as host. Myla sued seeing many similarities to her character, but the court ruled that likeness means actual representation of another person's appearance and not simply close resemblance. Peterson said Elvira is nothing like Vampyra aside from the black dress and hair, while Myla saw Vampyra's persona in her, including dialogue and jokes. Needless to say, the two did not speak after, and Myla struggled financially while Elvira took off. Here we are at Vinyl Fetish, 
or once was Vinyl Fetish. Now it's a record store behind us. Myla was a favorite of, among punks that leaned towards death rock. She collaborated with the Misfits and was in a band called Satan's Cheerleaders. Yay! <laughs> You were in that band, weren't you? I am that band. <laughs> <laughs> now, a record store uh, called Vinyl Fetish was the prime location to hang out. And she, con she continued appearing in various film pieces, but it really, in this time frame, it was movies like the punk rock musical Population. The director remembers seeing a wild lady living out in the back of a shed. In 1994, with renewed popularity, Vampira, um, as Tim Burton released Ed Wood. What I mean is that uh, Tim Burton had just come out with Ed Wood and uh, people were really flocking to Vampira again. Lisa Marie played the role of Vampira and interviews reignited Myla's charm and helped bring to light her innovative and influential spirit. Okay. So we, if we're here. so here we are at Myla's last residence, 1570 North Serrano Avenue. It's an apartment complex here. It's uh, in 2001. Myla, with help from fans, was running her own Vampires Attic website and sold autograph memorabilia along with original art. She was content living simply, much like a beatnik. But on January 10th, 2008, Myla died of natural causes at the age of 85. Vampira was buried in an urn in the Griffith Lawn section of the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. At first, a simple marker adorned her grave, but with fan support, she was given a proper headstone bearing her name and iconic character. Vampira Ghoul called the ghostess with the mostess way before Beetlejuice was the first to bring sexy humor and horror together. If you think about it, she was also the voice of women's lib at a time when Lucille Ball and Ricky were still sleeping in separate beds. She made it a little more acceptable to be weird and created a template for others to follow. In her own words, she hypnotized the public, public and boy, did they want more. Vampira will be remembered as a true virgin.